That doesn't seem right. Okay, that's better. Penny Dreadfuls, Analog Fiction, Popular Magazine, Dime Westerns, Dime Detectives, The Biggest Magazine, Adventure Magazine, Hero Pulps, Sea Stories, Pulp Spiders, Wonder Stories, Spicy Mystery, Writers of the Purple Sage, Cultural Artifacts, Weird Tales. The Pulps. That was the campy but creative mindset in the first half of the 20th century. The genius. The universe of pulp fiction writers during the golden age. Or it's an, it's an, it's it's one argument in the pulp enthusiast pulp collecting community is between the pulp canon and the pulps as medium. My name is Jason Carney and I study 20th century literature. Scholars have approached 20th century literature with kind of a, um, a dualistic model, elite literature versus non-artistic literature. I have always been interested in working class literature, and the Pulp Fiction magazine would be commodity literature. So it was the literature that, that you know, was supposed to entertain. And if you picked up a Western story magazine, um, you wanted it to have cowboys and expected scenarios of the standoff. So Pulp Fiction is often considered very formulaic. Weird Tales was a Pulp Fiction magazine that was unique in that it was established to be an experimental Pulp Fiction magazine. The common complaint was that I can't sell one or two of my manuscripts, you know, Western stories won't take them because there's the ghost. Weird Tales, the magazine that my dissertation focuses on, um, is intriguing in that it is a Pulp Fiction magazine that was published to have no formula. Pulp magazines began in America around the late 1890s. They dominated the American imagination in the 1920s and 30s. The covers are visually stunning and uncensored. The stories, well, let's just say that it's probably best you know many great American and British short fiction authors got their start in the pulps. From Burroughs to Lovecraft, the pulps are an important, creative, yet often forgotten or unknown American phenomenon that spans several decades in the early 20th century. As one pulp scholar put it, quote, The pulps are a glaring omission in the history of American readership. Printed on cheap wood pulp paper, they began slowly disintegrating in your hands the very year they were printed. It's a bit ironic then, wouldn't you say? that they are virtually unknown or underappreciated by the average American public today. The grandfather and grandmother of American comic books, the pulps began to disappear in the mid-1940s, but only after they virtually solidified American capitalism and modernism itself, seducing and satisfying the infinity of the human imagination, selling millions of copies a year in the 20s and 30s at 15 and 25 cents each. I am David Michael Earle. I'm a associate professor of English and book history at the University of West Florida in Pensacola. Uh, pulp magazines are the uh, fiction magazines um, published in America between roughly 1895 and uh, 1950. Uh, they were um, mass fiction for a general and popular audience, and it's where the majority of um, genre fiction uh, was born and uh, developed and came of age. 
So when it came time for me to write my dissertation, what I decided to do was actually approach modernist literature through the history of Pulp Fiction. Um, uh, by doing that, I found all these interrelationships and um, all these sort of lost um, uh, authors who had been involved in modernism and also Pulp Fiction, or well-known modernist authors who started their careers in Pulp Fiction, and of course, um, and writing for Pulp magazines, and what this divulged to me was a uh, a lost shadow history of respectable literature with foundations in this mass, and I mean that word mass in lots of different ways, um, this mass of, of overlooked um, both type of publication and literature that really was the reading material for millions of people for decades and decades in the United States. Respectable authors like William Faulkner and Ernest Hemingway, or little less known authors like Don Powell, all of whom were influenced by or published in pulp magazines, um, you know, during the 1920s or 19-teens uh, or earlier. Um, and of course, this is entirely overlooked because in academia, one does not study this type of literature. Most people don't know it, even though they know the ramifications of it. They know the heroes, they know the names, people like Zorro or Edgar Rice Burroughs or hard-boiled fiction, um, or even, for that matter, a lot of romance fiction, etc. Uh, they know that kind of heritage, or they know, if anything, they know the spicy covers and the sensational covers, when really that's just the tip of the iceberg of what Pulp Fiction was. Of, um, of publishing and of a type of literature that's largely ignored, um, and unjustly so. And there are lots of reasons um, that we should study this type of literature. The first and foremost is, again, this is where um, the majority of the genres that are now so very popular stem from. Um, it's where sort of uh, definitely a school, a large school of fantasy came from. It's where science fiction um, comes from. It's where hard-boiled detective fiction comes from. It's where the sort of modern romance comes from, right? So genres that were very that are very popular um, today have a background, ha have their foundations in this type of publishing. Um, but really, more than that, this is the literature of the masses. This is this was the literature of the working class. Um, this was what the majority of people uh, read. Uh, and could afford to read would whole generations of um, immigrants sort of uh, cut their reading teeth on, uh, if you will, because it's what was available to them. Nicole, how did you get interested? Through Jason or? Well, actually, he got interested through you. Me. That's awesome. The, the, um, the three big ones that published in uh, Weird Tales were H.P. Lovecraft, who's on her shirt. Yeah, yep. yep. <laughs> uh, Robert E. Howard, who invented um, uh, the sword and sorcery genre. Um, the character most people might be familiar with is Conan the Barbarian. And then um, the third writer, who, you know, wonderful stylist. He's not as visible in um, popular culture as Robert E. Howard and H.P. Lovecraft, but he's, 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 he's wonderful. He was he was very important for Weird Tales. Is Clark Ashton Smith. I would add to that that there are other writers who became very foundational for a lot of the genres that we have today in popular culture. Um, and one of them is C.L. Moore. He was a, she was a female author, and she never tried to hide her identity, even though she um, used the abbreviations of her name. Um, but she was really inspirational, I think, for a lot of writers. Just her character, I'm blanking on it, became the inspiration for Indiana Jones, right? Uh, I don't know. That may be apocryphal. Okay. The one interesting thing for literary theorists, I know that's probably not the most interesting topic of literary theory, but like when the reason why English professors are interested in the print um, history of um, pulp magazines is because of the 
authorship is so unique in the mm -hmm. pulps. Um, you may even have a situation where it's, you know, first off, there's this romantic notion of authorship where there's like one genius writer who, who creates these beautiful stories because he or she has a message to transmit. That is not the case in the pulps yeah. at all. What you have is actually authorship transfers to the magazine itself. Mm -hmm. You have the magazine is the site of creation and the stories that emerge in the magazine um, come out of the readers who are buying it and supporting that kind of story, the editor who is asking writers for a specific kind of story, um, and the writers obviously who are doing the you know um, the hard work of writing the story. But all of these elements come together so the pulp authorship is less an individual creating a story, telling a yarn, is more of like the magazine or the culture itself. It's almost like like we've talked. People have compared the pulps to the oral tradition in literature in in, yeah. in modernity. Yeah, it's community and collaborative storytelling. Um, and I think in, in a lot of ways, it's it's really interesting to see net social networked communities for like fan sites and, and fan fiction. I think you can make a similar case for what was happening in the pulps. Um, these writers would often be fan fanboy fangirling over each other. Like the first letter, did Howard write Lovecraft? Lo Lovecraft wrote Howard first, right? Mm -hmm. And. Howard's response back to Lovecraft is just, it's just oozing of complimentariness and excitedness. You can tell he's just so excited that this author that he is obviously very invested in and, and uh, interested in reading has written him and reached out. And that's one of the beautiful things I think that's happening is it's really the whole pulp area gets rid of this notion of the single author genius mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of exposing what writing is which is this highly collaborative community-based process where authors work with each other and their editors yeah. and their readership yeah. but also the flip side of that which is all of these females with you know editing mm -hmm. writing in charge of helping in some way and the artwork too yeah like the covers, yeah uh, one of the really well known and I think still sought after is Margaret Brundridge. She did a lot of the very famous Weird Tail covers mm -hmm. um, where originals would probably go for lots and lots of oh, money yeah. I imagine. Yeah. Uh, but yeah she I mean she was very uh, foundational with with again the aesthetic look and feel and tone in some ways the tone of the stories I would argue. I was as I was watching this presentation I thought here's like feminism 1.5 right like this this particular woman doing this particular magazine because it was so before second wave, but it was obviously well after first wave. Right. I'm, I'm thinking about like when I go to Pulp Fest, you're kind of on some level preaching to the choir if you're up there. And, and one thing I run into being of, of the younger generation, and I think a lot of us who are getting into the Pulp Studies now in the last, I mean, I'd say maybe the last decade almost, we're apart from the generation that grew up reading these things. Right. So it's, but the great thing about that is a lot of the scholarship that's been done before, these guys, um, the, the previous generation, are totally open to talking about the history. They've written tons of tons. And one thing I always say to people when they ask me about what books to read uh, for, for folk studies, and I say up until really the last couple of years, there hasn't been a whole lot of, a lot of academic uh, inquiry into it. Your best bet is to go and read the fan publications because these guys have researched particular magazines, individual authors, uh, individual storylines. I mean, it's just probably some, probably more scholarship has done, been done in the folks in the fan uh, arena than it has been for comic books in the academic arena. You're obviously a collector, um, so uh, what else do you do? Why pulps? What got you here uh, to this point? The art is what really, really fascinated me initially, and it started out collecting paperbacks, uh, then kind of gravitated to this, sh this show in particular and that because they had paperbacks. Then I saw the pulps and sort of fell in love with the art and everything, so now I had the pulps and I also had the artwork. Love Story uh, made uh, set the record for the highest selling Pulp Fiction magazine ever. It was selling 600,000 copies a week. And Daisy was um, 
the editor of Love Story from 1928 until the very end, which is 1947. Respect and Trust is another thing. Right, that's true. She wrote a um, that's true. she wrote an essay that was she wrote it anonymously, and it was uh, printed in New, the New York Women. That was a magazine in the ni- late 1936, and in it she talks about all the uh, discrimination that she was receiving as, you know, as being this woman editor. What? So here she has this big job Uh as a female editor. Huge. Huge. Right. But yet was experiencing discrimination and wrote about it anonymously, you said? And what did she say? Well, she said a lot. Um, She talked about the fact that she was maybe one of... A half a, maybe one of a dozen women in the entire country that was making over twelve thousand dollars a year at that point, and then she talked about the fact that um, it seems that in the world of business, it only seems that the women, uh, the women do well when they can do something that the men absolutely need them to do, meaning that they fill they fill the vacuum at that point. But at the same time, they experienced a lot of discrimination. Um, Her biggest gripe was that she had put forth a lot of different ideas to the head of the company to help them save money or to make more money. And they turned down her ideas, but then they turned around and accepted the ideas when they were submitted by men. I'm the marketing programming director of Pulp Fest. Uh, we started in 2009 uh, when a, a previous convention known as PulpCon uh, kind of died. Uh, four of us got together and put this show together, and the uh, first year about 400 people attended. And it's kind of the size of it, between four and 500 people. Uh, my primar- I primarily sell uh, reprints of old pulp fiction. Uh, over the last 20, 30 years, uh, many small publishers have started reprinting uh, stories from the pulps. Uh, this was a, the Moon Man was a hero, uh, who kind of a Robin Hood figure. And, Kai Gore was Tarzan, uh, another version of Tarzan. There were aviation heroes. Uh, the Black Bat came out around the same time as Batman. So, well, how about Pulp Fest 2017? Woo! <laughs> That's a good uh, idea. It's the last two weeks of July, maybe the first two weeks of August in that time period. The theme will be hard boiled dicks, dangerous dames, <laughs> and. Uh, a couple of psychos. Ibrahim, keep a swaying when you play on the type from Boner. The last boy who plays the fiddle just to play a bit of tea. And has a man from Savannah. Play on that piano. Play some jazz or harmony. Oh, everybody has it. Please can it. All over town. We're going by. All of the 
The life of the average pulp writer was seven years, although there was nothing average about the writers themselves. The pulps were a playground to practice writing, to explore imaginative possibilities, to invent and develop new characters, such as the Man of Bronze, who would later become the Man of Steel, or Superman, as we know him today. You may not get paid very well, or at all, but the pulp authors, cover artists, and editors were laborers at the crossroads of art and industry. Amazing stories of all genres, read by millions for several decades, the pulps are not without controversy. From blackface to black masks, from women on meat hooks to repeated scenes of surgical procedures on female anatomy, eastern demons and foreign invaders, to romance stories of white women in skimpy dresses being rescued by their white male cowboys, we find here a series of American phenomena still present today. These trends need to be noted adequately, but the pulps also led to open discussions, stories, and new visually stunning covers of the African-American hero, the female astronaut and scientist, same-sex love and relationships, and much more in the realm of social and intellectual progress. It's a mixed bag of human sentiments and foibles. What will we do now, after 90 years of pulp history, adored by some, forgotten by most? Once an infinite spark of possibilities, entertainment, news, both mass-produced and a secret door to the human imagination and creative spark, they are an American phenomena to be continually uncovered, rediscovered, enjoyed, and studied. a young reader, a bored reader with a hard life or, or some any kind of um, tough times in your life, you don't want to wrestle sentence by sentence to try to figure out what Dostoevsky is talking about in this. You want to be swept away and just join the adventure that these people are in. And I wanted to go to these far off places. I wanted to explore alien worlds and that's where the pulp adventures took me. As some pulp scholars refer back to insights by Baudelaire, as modernism celebrated what was common and marginal, well, there isn't a better example than the pulps. Oh, wait, there's someone at the door. Time for my escape. 
catch you on the flip side. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> Guy comes over and he goes, You like weirds? <laughs> I like weirds.